It is seven o'clock and let's wait and see who is jumping on so we can greet folks. Looks like we've got 18 participants so far. Attendees, Ann West, Ms. Briggs, Brent and Aaron Scro dennis my wife, Deborah Baldwin, board member Ian Beard, Jennifer Carmen, John Hendrick, uh, Karen Reynolds, other people, my eyes are getting bad, Nancy Hamlin, Sarah Lane, I'm sorry if I miss people. Director Stephanie Wade is on. Thank you, Director Wade, for joining on. Miss Knight, Miss DePriest, Tricia, Miss Garrett, or Mr. Garrett. Um, I will start at seven o'clock. My name is Jonathan Warren. I am the Historic Arkansas Museum Board Foundation President and want to thank you for joining us for this third History is Served dinner curbside. And so hopefully one day we'll get to do this again in person soon. But want to start off by thanking the sponsors, Arkansas Grown and Arkansas Made. And in your gift bag, you will find an Arkansas Grown koozie. So please check that out and read about the food and everybody today who's participating. Um, Arkansas Made and Arkansas Grown are programs of the Arkansas Department of Agriculture. And so the Arkansas Grown program promotes the many agricultural products grown in the state of Arkansas and the Arkansas Made program, not to be confused with the museum's Arkansas Made program, promotes products that are made here in the state of Arkansas. And also want to thank the Arkansas, I'm sorry, the Historic Arkansas Museum Foundation. Tonight, we have a pre-recorded video from Chef Aaron Fowler of the wonderful Cypress Social, which used to be the cock of the walk in Maumelle and our guest speaker, David Fowler, who will be joining us live and want to thank both of them. But to answer everybody's burning questions, no, they are not related. They just happen to have the same last name of Fowler. And so after our guest speaker, we will have a brief five minute Q&A. We may be able to go a couple minutes longer. We'll have to monitor time and see what happens. But put your questions for David in the chat. And also, as everybody surely knows by now, you know, a year and a half into the pandemic, chat back and forth in the chat function or chat um, to everybody. Just be mindful of if you don't mean to hit everybody and you hit everybody, everybody's gonna see it. So just remember that, but please chat back and forth and please make sure that you um, have questions out for everybody. We're going to start with a poll. And so the first poll of the night is going to be, what is your favorite way to eat Arkansas corn and so you've probably had your own unique way to eat it um i like corn on the cob i like popcorn if you're like my wife my wife will take her corn on the cob and she will tilt it like this and then she will take a knife and she'll cut it off because she won't you know do all that like most people do it uh but your choices are on the cob cornbread cream corn popcorn corn fritters or a corn salsa or corn salad. So everybody please vote right quick on that. And so I will choose my way. Well, it won't let me vote. I'm a, I'm a host, so it won't let, me, won't let me vote. But I would say popcorn if I had to choose. And so um, let's see what the results are for the poll. So on the cob is the overwhelming, well, not overwhelming, 47% to 42% on cornbread. So it was nine votes for corn on the cob, eight votes for cornbread. Nobody voted for cream corn. Nobody voted for popcorn, which would have been my vote. Uh, one vote for corn fritters and one vote for corn salsa or corn salad. So next, what we have is we want to introduce you to the person who created the meal for you tonight, Chef Aaron Fowler has been with Cypress Social since the grand opening a year ago, August, 2020. His experience before this is he was in Minneapolis working in restaurants and teaching. He and his family moved to Arkansas a little over a year ago and have been excited to join the many culinary talents here in the Little Rock area. Because seven o'clock right now is a busy time for Chef Fowler, he made us a video to share tonight about the meal and his inspiration for the meal. And so we're gonna share that with you right now.
So my name is Aaron Bowen. Uh, I'm the executive chef here at Cypher Social. Uh, I've been part of the Cypher Social team for exactly a year now. Uh, we opened a year ago uh, this week, so this week celebrates our birthday week, which I'm excited about. Um, but a little bit about myself, where I've come from. I've lived all around the country. Um, most recently, I've lived in Minneapolis for about eight years, working in um, hotels and public and restaurants. One um, standout restaurant was a southern restaurant, southern and food inspired restaurant, I should say. Uh, where I learned a thing or two about fried chicken, I brought my fried chicken down here, tweaked it a little bit, and so Monday nights we do a fried chicken night, which is pretty awesome. So uh, my experience is uh, kind of all over, not necessarily rooted in like the southern style that we have here currently, but um, that's one of the things that I took a lot at home, this good, tasty, uh, good southern food. So I really enjoy the if you're not familiar with Cypress Social or uh, haven't got the chance to come up here and visit uh, us yet, uh, first of all, it's a super unique and picturesque restaurant. It's kind of right off Momo Boulevard, but I would say you don't really know it. Um, just by sitting here, it's really quiet and peaceful. We have a beautiful patio to sit outside um, and just take in the scenery, the beautiful lake that we have. Uh, so it's more of a destination restaurant, uh, I would say, and it's a place that um, for sure has become a favorite of a lot of our patrons and we see them every week. It's great. Um, the atmosphere here, I like that we call it Cypher Social. Um, I put this on the social part because it's a restaurant I would say I would like Did to you take care of that or anybody actually <laughs> just hang out and have a really good time. Uh, it gets a little bit rowdy and I think that's a great thing. I think it's a place that's fun to just have um, you know, drinks or um, you know, food and just come and hang out with some friends and have a really good time. So the inspiration for this meal uh, tonight off the center ground corn from the team. Um, it's awesome summertime vegetable, well, but what else is summertime except corn. And so uh, so the meal tonight, uh, the first course, the heirloom tomato and burrata salad. Uh, for the corn component in that, it's uh, kind of beginning of the corn's life, I would say. So it's the corn shoots with the uh, sprout and the corn sprout. Um, the flavor is really concentrating the corn. It tastes it's amazingly um, like corn. So that's the first component of that on the dish. Our next, uh, I would necessarily say corn's are right on the next to that is the cornbread that are cut there makes that fantastic. Cornbread, one of the best cornbreads I've ever had in my life. Amazing. So, that's your cornbread side. Uh, it's going to go with the salad. And then for your main course, we have a delicious uh, pork chop with a corn machu and collard greens. Um, a little bit about the corn machu. Corn machu is the southern side, um, similar to psychotox, if you're familiar with that, but uh, it has an addition of an anchovy sausage. And it's typically a little bit spicy with a little jalapeno in there, too. Uh, and that's the corner in the main entree. And then the dessert is a s'mores version of popcorn that, again, took there as a shout um, and bringing in a little bit of smoky um, from like smoked salt and um, make, make it summertime and turning that into um, popcorn. So it's a pretty cool idea. Um, and the last question that I was asked about ways that I like to prepare corn myself, either home or, or wherever I am. So, Corn is one of my favorite vegetables, honestly. Um, I love a corn pudding and make that with like some blackened shrimp. Um, or spoon and grill on the grill with uh, kind of Mexican style sweet corn. And the uh, uh, cilantro. Those are just my two of my many.
also want to thank everybody for jumping on who has jumped on since this started. We're now up to 31 participants, including my parents and my in-laws. So I want to shout out to all my family and tell them thanks for joining on. And thank you for everybody who's joined on um, since we're welcoming people at the front. So thank you for all the participants who are coming on. And just to plug Cypress Social, from the video when you saw Chef speaking behind him, there is an outdoor area with a lot of picnic tables. And if you remember how Cock of the Walk is, there is a lake over here. And so even with COVID and some people have their own comfort levels of where they want to go or what they want to do. Um, and my comfort level is not still out here, but I took my wife and child there for Mother's Day weekend and we sat outside and the food was wonderful and the atmosphere is great and it's very safe. So I would urge everybody to go visit Cypress Social and also want to give a shout out to the Petite and Key folks for doing this for us. It was truly appreciated. And thank you for Chef for doing that video. And so now we have a special guest speaker coming to you from the state of Oklahoma. And now I would like to introduce to you David Fowler. He is the Northeast Regional Director for the Oklahoma Historical Society. He manages four historic sites in Northeast Oklahoma, including Hunter's Home, a living history farm dedicated to 19th century agriculture in the Cherokee Nation. David has worked for the OHS for 20 years. During that time, most of his focus has been on food and agricultural history. And David also serves on the board of the Arkansas Living History Association and serves as the Mountain Plains District Representative for the Association for Living History Farm and Agricultural Museums, which is an international organization with members in the United States, Canada, and Europe. David is a Cherokee Nation citizen and lives in Park Hill, Oklahoma. And he is also a good friend of Ham and has even cooked in our very own Brownlee House kitchen at the museum. David is joining us live from the state of Oklahoma in the kitchen in one of the properties that he manages, Hunter's Home. David, thank you so much for joining us and we truly appreciate you tonight. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warren, for having me. And for everybody at HAM, uh, uh, thank you for inviting me uh, um, to, uh, to speak tonight. And uh, they wanted me to uh, talk to you all and give you a little bit of background on corn. And so uh, I thought I would uh, to cover about five of the basic types of corn that are out there. Um, not all corn is the same. Not all of it is used for the same purpose. Um, I have been uh, growing corn here at Hunter's Home at the historic site uh, for going on probably eight years now. Um, if you were to ask me how corn is grown in a modern sense with tractors and uh, large machinery and, and acres and acres of uh, uh, farmland, I probably couldn't tell you how you can do it, but I can tell you how they did it in the 1850s. And um, so to start out with, a cornfield in the 1850s, a large cornfield was only about three acres, um, you know, particularly in our area here in, um, in the very edge of the Ozarks. Uh, we're actually uh, part of the, where Tahlequah and, and Park Hill is located. Um, we're about uh, five miles from where the Ozarks end if you head west. Um, we're actually about five miles into it if you're heading east. So uh, we're either at the end or the start of the Ozarks. Um, but uh, we, uh, we grow several types of corn here in the historic site. Um, and, uh, and we use it for different purposes. Um, so uh, um, the first kind of uh, type of corn that we usually grow is, um, is that we will grow uh, what they consider to be a flint corn. And this is what, uh, what designates a, a particular type of corn as, as a flint corn. And uh, you can see here, I have uh, one of the kernels off of, uh, off of an ear of corn here. And you can see how it's very glossy and shiny. Um, it, uh, this is usually what constitutes as, uh, as a flint corn, which is the shininess of the outside of the, of the shell. And I'll kind of hold that still there so you can see it a little bit better. Um, I, like most of the rest of you all, are probably getting used to this Zoom um, business. I'm usually used to doing this in person, standing in front of someone. Um, but, uh, but so this is, a, is, is flint corn. And this corn can be used in, um, in making hominy. It, uh, 
it can be used to uh, to grind into uh, into cornmeal. Um, but uh, but usually what was uh, what this corn was used for in the 19th century was for uh, livestock feed. All right. So um, so this is uh, this is flint corn, um, one of the particular types of, uh, of varieties of corn that could be grown um, in the 19th century. And we still have flint corn around today. All right. So the other type of, uh, of corn that we grow um, and that they grew in the 19th century, and this is probably one of the absolute most popular um, varieties of corn to be grown in the 19th century, and even today, um, is called a dent corn. And as you can see in the very end of the, of the kernel there, there's a, a small dent that forms when this corn is dried out. Um, most dent corns and as well as the, the, uh, the flint corn, um, it is corn that is left into the field to dry. All right, so, uh, so it will be planted um, in the spring and will be harvested in the fall after the, the ears have completely dried out. And so this particular um, variety of corn, um, and also I might add that flint corn can also be a dent corn, okay? So, but the shininess of the, of the shell is what, uh, is what designates it as a flint corn. But uh, most dent corns were grown um, for the purpose of turning into hominy or into grits and, uh, and it could be ground into cornmeal, all right? So basically hominy is, um, is, is taking a, a corn of this nature, um, a field type corn, um, soaking it in an alkali solution. It can either be in, um, in what they call slake lime or pickling lime, or it can be um, in, in cooked or soaked in lye first. Um, lye is a, is a product that we get from soaking wood ashes. A lot of times in the 19th century, they would not just take the juice off of the ashes after they soaked them in, the, in, in water, but they would also just take the sifted ashes and put equal parts of ashes to equal parts of corn, and then they would boil that until the water had evaporated, let it set overnight, and then they would wash it, and it removes the outside of the of the shell on the corn so that you can get to the, to the inside of the corn, which is where all the B vitamins are at. So basically just eating this, your body cannot digest it. And thousands of years ago, uh, native people um, in North America figured out that if they remove the shell, then their bodies can get the nutrients out of the ear of corn that, um, that they need. Now to step back a moment and talk about corn a little bit, is that corn comes from a grass. It started out in the Central Valley of Mexico um, as the Tio Cente plant. And from there, it was hybridized um, into Zia maize that we have today, which is, is corn. And, um, and so this particular variety of corn that we have, that, I have, that we grow here at Hunter's Home is called Cherokee white flower corn. So this is a true flower corn. Um, once it's processed down, it can be uh, turned into a flower, almost the consistency of talcum powder, um, unlike a lot of the other uh, corns that, that I've talked about first. Um, this, uh, the meal that comes off of this corn is a lot finer. The characteristic of this type of corn is it has a very dull shell. It's very smooth on the top. So you can see right here across the top, it's very rounded and very smooth. Um, this particular variety of corn has been grown by Cherokee people for as long as that anybody's ever known anything about Cherokees. Um, one of the very unique things that they did is that they figured that, that pre-contact um, with uh, Europeans, that Cherokees had nearly 14 different varieties of corn that they would grow. And in order to keep the varieties pure, they would grow this corn and uh, each, each variety of this would have its own valley that it would be grown in. They would continually grow corn in that valley and save the seed. Some of that seed would go out to the villages and the people would raise 
that particular uh, variety of corn until it became cross-contaminated with another variety and it did not produce as well. They would return back to the seed bank in that valley and bring more corn out. So, um, so this is one of the, of the ancient varieties of, of uh, corn that the Cherokee people still have today. Um, and this is one of the varieties that, is, uh, uh, that we grow the most here at Hunter's Home. Um, and it makes excellent, excellent um, corn flour. So, all right. And then the fourth variety that we have, of course, is, is popcorn. And you can see it, usually popcorn comes in a very tiny little seed. Uh, pop, popcorn is, is technically a flint corn, but its characteristic is, is that when it's put to heat, it pops. And so, um, and so you can see this little seed, you know, usually puffs up into a, a, a piece of corn about the size of my thumb. And in the 19th century and before, the most popular way of eating popcorn was not as we do today, where we pop it and salt it and, uh, and eat it, but it was to uh, pop it and pour a sweet cream on it and sometimes add sugar to it. And it was more of a breakfast food uh, than a snack food as we, as we use it today. All right, so this is uh, this popcorn, the fourth variety of corn that we have. Now the last variety of corn, and this is probably, and actually, uh, you know, on the, uh, uh, on the poll, um, they, uh, uh, everybody voted 47% uh, for sweet corn. And as you can see, we have a kernel of sweet corn here. Um, sweet corn did not really come about until the 1840s. So the very first commercial sweet corn is what this variety is here is called Stoll's Evergreen. And uh, it came in around 1845. Uh, by 1850, it was starting to become a little bit popular, but uh, this corn is intended to be eaten in its green stage, which means um, as the, the ear has formed and the silk, the brown silk on the end is starting to, uh, to dry out, this corn is ready to be eaten. That is what we consider to be green corn. Dried corn is, is, is of course, um, the finished product, all right? So, um, so you can see the difference in the seed here that um, the corn has, uh, as it dries out on the sweet corn, all of the starches and the milks and the sugars that's inside of there um, dry up and evaporate. So you can still toast this and use it, um, but you can tell definitely that our flour corns and our meal corns um, are, are definitely a lot more to them um, than our commercial sweet corns are today. So in the 19th century, if you wanted sweet corn, um, as your field corn was starting to, to enter the green stage, um, they would pull what they call roasting ears. And that's what exactly what it means is that they were taken to a pit and they were roasted or they were roasted over an open fire to bring the starches and the sugars out in that ear of corn. And so, so they did have roasting ears um, and they were a little bit sweet, but, um, but corn back in the, in the 19th century was really mainly for the purpose of, of grinding and, and into a flour or feeding the livestock, turning into hominy. So, um, so those are the five basic types of corn that, that, um, that we have in, in North America. Um, and, uh, and that kind of covers the uses of what, uh, of what they were used for. Um, I definitely have some time for questions. Um, if if uh, someone can, uh, let me go over to the chat and see uh, if someone has. Uh, there is one question. Um, first question that I see in the chat is, did the Cherokee people make corn flour? Yes, um, it was, uh, uh, corn flour was a part of, uh, you know, of course corn was always a part of their diet. Um, but uh, they would uh, uh, they would make a, a, a cornbread that was similar to um, uh, to what we have today. Uh, it would be uh, it would either be fried in, in uh, um, you know in some sort of a fat or it would be boiled 
um, and cooked. Uh, they would also wrap it up uh, with, uh, mix it with, uh, with beans. They would, you know, they would cook beans, make a bean paste and a cornmeal paste, pack it together. It was almost like, a, um, uh, it was almost like um, what we considered to be a tamale today without the sauce on it. Uh, they would wrap it either in a, in a grape leaf or in a, uh, in a, uh, a corn shuck and, uh, and, then, and then boil it and make a, a type of uh, bread that in that fashion with it as well. So, it, uh, so, you know, the Cherokee white flour corn definitely goes back, I mean, you know, a, a, a thousand years or better. So, and a lot of people still also think that, um, you know, that until, you know, until Europeans came to North America, that corn were those little tiny ears of corn that we see, um, you know, a lot of times in museums, those were the first ears. Um, you know, there were regular standard size ears of corn, um, you know, which were the white variety, they're, they're the white cob you see here. That's the standard size of a cob for Cherokee white flower corn. Um, usually has eight to 10 rows of seeds per, uh, per cob. And uh, there's about 350 to 400 seeds um, on each ear of corn. So, you know, one of these little, one of these little seeds, you know, produces, um, you know, a plant that produces uh, two ears to it. And uh, so you're really getting a pretty good return for your, for your dollar. Um, in our corn fields, we still plant in a, in what they call a hill fashion. Uh, corn was, um, was planted with other companion plants, um, you know, in, uh, uh, all the way up until you know the early 1800s, um, so it would be planted with uh, with beans and squash. The beans would provide um, nitrogen to the corn plant, which is a very heavy nitrogen feeder. Um, it would deplete the soil very quickly if you didn't you know introduce nitrogen back in. And then pumpkins were also planted um, in with the corn to shade the ground to give it. Um, uh, to give it, you know, a, a, a stop the uh, evaporation process. Um, we plant, uh, we do not plant um, uh, uh, beans with, within our corn patch today. Um, we have about an acre sized corn field that we grow uh, on a yearly basis. Um, we plant in a hill fashion, which is, uh, you know, originally they would kill the dirt to plant um, four corn seeds. And seven, uh, and, and seven bean seeds and three squash seeds in each one of these hills, which were about three feet around. Um, by, the, by the 1850s, most Cherokees had, had ditched all of that. They were simply planting um, about every 46 inches apart, four corn seeds, and then they would plant a couple of pumpkin seeds. And we grow um, this particular type of pumpkin in our field. Uh, this is a pumpkin that comes um, all throughout the southeast that we see. Um, I received the first seeds uh, from my pumpkins from a gentleman from the Creek Nation whose uh, name was Mike Berryhill. Uh, he's passed on now. And I've been growing these pumpkins for at least 18 years now. And um, so far, um, I've had very good luck with that. So they grow very well with the, the corn. Um, and we'll go in at the end of the season, harvest our, our dried corn and the pumpkins and, uh, and store them. These are not necessarily a animal fodder pumpkin like we see you know, with the Connecticut field pumpkin and a lot of the pumpkins that are grown um, by Anglo farmers, which were intended to be fed um, to livestock. These are um, for human consumption. They make the, the absolute best pumpkin soup, fried pumpkin, um, and uh, they keep, you know, almost for an entire year if you keep them in the right atmosphere. So within the cornfield, there are other plants that are very beneficial, um, you know, for, you know, for that to, to, to have a successful corn harvest. So, uh, One so question, I'll go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I just wonder if there were any more questions. Yes, there were. I'm I'm going to try to get to all of them. We've got a lively panel, which is great. And questions are coming in the, in the QA and the chat. So that's wonderful. 
So the next question that was posed is, which um, which corn is the most nutritious? Um, pr probably um, the, uh, the the Cherokee white flower corn. Uh, with a second runner up as being uh, the uh, white dent corn, which is this is um, uh, this is called Hickory King. Uh, comes out of Tennessee. It's probably um, has probably been uh, with the Shawnee people for. Um, you know, as many years as, as the, the Cherokee white flower uh, corn is. Um, so that, that, would be, that would be my guess. Um, you know, probably today sweet corn has a, you know, because of the way it's grown, um, probably has a lot of, uh, of uh, nutrition value in there as well. Um, but, you know, turning it into hominy and, and, uh, and being able to get those B vitamins out of there uh, is really probably the absolute best way to, to, to eat corn. Okay, thank you for that. Next question, how many ears are usually on a stalk? Um, usually on, uh, on a lot of these uh, uh, heirloom variety, these open air pollinated uh, corns, um, there are usually two ears to the stalk. The difference in, in these uh, older varieties and this open air pollinated corns that we grow um, are not like the corns that we see as we drive through, you know, you know the, the river bottom and see, you know, just row after row of corn. It's all at the same height. Um, it all has an ear on it that's on the same side, usually produces one ear. And so, um, and, and it, if you see different heights in the cornfield out there, it's usually because there's a deficiency in the, in, the, in the soil out there. You know, it's had too much water. Maybe it's a low area and it'll eventually kind of catch up. But these grow at a different pace. They're just like we are. Um, you know, not every, uh, you know, not every flower blooms at the same time. And that's the way these old varieties of corn are. And they do some really, really cool things. A lot of times they will, they will throw a little cob off of the tassel that comes out of the top. That's where the pollen is in the, in the corn. So that drops the, the pollen down to pollinate the ear. Uh, a lot of times the, 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 the ear itself will separate. And there'll be two small ears within the within the, the shuck, or sometimes it will tassel out of the cob. Um, so these older varieties are 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 always trying to turn themselves back into the grass that they came from, and um, and, and so they they do some really peculiar things while they're in the field. But most generally, we get um, two ears to the to the stalk off of the Cherokee white flower. Okay. Thank you. This next question is a two part question. First okay. part of the question is, did the central Mexicans use corn differently than the Cherokees or others in the country? And then the second part of the question is, which corn is used for masa and tortillas? Um, so, yes, that they did. And to be able to answer that fully, every every tribe in North America, you know, from the end of South America to the you know, to the polar cap. Um, they have different varieties of corn that they grew and different uses for that corn. Um, there is a, a particular variety of corn called, uh, um, called white eagle corn. It's a Cherokee variety of corn. Um, you can look it up at Seed Saver Exchange and a lot of that has, um, has uh, sells that variety of corn. A lot of people think you can see a little you know, outline of a white eagle that's, uh, you know, that's on the, the kernel of the corn itself. Um, it is a very low nutritional value corn, but it's used still today in ceremony. Um, so, you know, this is a particular variety of corn that would be eaten at, you know, at a particular time when everybody's gathered together as part of a ceremonial meal. So, yes, everybody, you know, does, you um, uh, use corn and grow corn for different reasons and different purposes. Um, and uh, uh, today, uh, to make masa, probably um, a white dent corn of this particular nature uh, would be the best for doing that. It, um, so, you know, you know, this is a, um, so a, a, a white dent corn um, would be your best bet for masa. Okay, the next question is how much corn annually would be produced in a three acre cornfield? Um, 
40 bushels to an acre, 40 to 45 bushels an acre is what the 19th century farmer pushed for. So that, uh, you know, that's, uh, that was, you know, relatively the, the, the gauge. Um, I got lucky one year and, uh, and, and I, off of a half an acre, I produced 40 bushels. So, uh, and that's unshelled corn. Um, you know, shelled corn, once it's, you know, once it's taken off of the cob, um, you know, is off. They would, they would take it straight from the field um, and, and store it in a corn crib, which is a, a log cabin type structure with ventilation through it. So it would, it would dry out. And yes, critters were able to get to it. That's why you had animals, you know, like cats and, and, uh, and particular types of dogs keep rats down. So, yeah. Okay. Good deal. I think we're going to try to squeeze in a couple more questions. We've got okay. a lot. I apologize if we can't get to everybody's. Um, has the height of corn changed over the years? Absolutely. And that's a great question. Um, today, most uh, modern varieties of sweet corn are barely six feet high. Um, they are uh, like with our wheat. Our wheat today is about four feet off of the ground and maybe three feet. Wheat in the 19th century was almost barely as, as tall as a man, six feet. The corn that we grow, uh, the Cherokee white flower corn, uh, grows a stalk between 12 to 13 feet high. Okay, so, and, uh, and, and modern field corn is roughly around six to seven feet high. So uh, today they're trying to put more into the ear than they really are into the plant. Um, which is why they've tried to reduce the size of the, of the, the stock down. Um, farmers in the 19th century were going to use that stock for other purposes as well. They pulled fodder off of the corn plant. So when the, when the corn was dry, the bottom three leaves started to die up the plant. They would strip all the leaves off and use it as, a, as an animal feed. Um, and then later they would cut the stalks down and stoop them up in a, in, you know, like a big stack, and then they would burn them for fertilizer. So they're using those stalks today. They just, you know, they go out as chafe, you know, onto the field. Uh, so that's a very good question. Okay. One other question was today: some people put sugar in cornbread. Was that something that was done before now? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's a, yes, it was. That you know, that's the. That, that brings up the same, the same argument as, you know, is it, you know, you like soft bacon or, or you know, or crispy bacon. It, it's a, you know, you, everybody has a, a way of doing it, but yes, um, they did. And, um, you know, I've seen a lot of Cherokee recipes for cornbread that had sugar in them or, or some form of a sweetener. Um, I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, of 19th and 18th century, um, you know, recipes that had sugar in them, a lot that don't. So, um, you know, and, and it can be a regional thing as well. A lot of people usually, you know, you know, calculate that, that cornbread and sugar, you know, sugar and cornbread is a northern thing and cornbread without sugar is more of a southern thing. Um, but, uh, you know, I've, I, I have, you know, lots of an, you know, ancestors from other places, recipes passed down and, um, you know, folks from Arkansas are putting the, putting sugar in cornbread, so. Good deal. Uh, and what's your favorite way to eat corn? My favorite way to eat corn um, is, is, is definitely hominy. So it, it's, uh, um, I, can, uh, I can eat hominy with almost every, every, every meal of the, of the day. Okay, I think that we have answered of everybody's questions, what I want to do is um, you've gotten a couple comments that it's super interesting and I would chime in and echo that learned a lot about corn and it's fun to eat, but it's really great to hear the history behind foods and that's that's exactly what this is about. So we thank you again for being here. I'd like to just pause just for a couple seconds. I think we got everybody's questions, but if we did not please put it in the chat right quick. And I think that we can get it addressed. I don't want to leave anybody out. We've gotten some thank yous, very good presentation. I would echo that. Uh, last call again for questions in the chat from Mr. Fowler. I believe we have a couple more minutes that so he could probably squeeze one more question in. Um, we're getting a lot of thank yous, which again, I echo that. 
I don't see any more questions in the chat. So Mr. Fowler, thank you again for joining us from Oklahoma. And so what we're gonna do now is toss it to the second poll of the night, which is what is your favorite dish of the evening? The first choice is heirloom tomato salad with corn shoots, the Cypress cornbread, the roasted pork loin, if you had the cheesy corn fritters, which was the vegetarian option, that is a vote. And s'mores caramel corn would be the last. Hosts and panelists cannot vote and not to try to influence anybody's vote. But if I had a vote, I would vote for the s'mores caramel corn because it was amazing, but everything else was amazing too. So we'll give everybody just one more quick minute to vote. Heirloom tomato salad, Cypress cornbread, roasted pork loin, cheesy corn fritters, or the s'mores caramel corn. So I think we can see what the results are. Thank you, Mr. Warren, for having me. You are correct. Um, if it's okay, well, let's do this and then I'm gonna shoot you one more question if that's okay. I had one more pop up. Um, the cornbread was the overwhelming favorite, 11 votes for that, five votes for the heirloom tomato salad, no votes for the pork loin, five votes for the corn fritters, and two votes for the caramel corn. Caramel corn. Um, so everybody loved the cornbread. I would agree it was very good. We're gonna end early, so I'll toss it back to you for one more question. Um, and this is a great question. How did you get into this line of study? Wow, that, uh, well, first of all, I love history and I, and I, and I love Cherokee history. It's, uh, it, you know, for me, it's a great honor to, not just be a historian of Cherokee history, but to be a Cherokee historian and, uh, you know, to be able to tell, you know, our history. But, you know, I, I grew up on a farm. I guess it's, uh, you know, it, it, I, my father left the farm. So, of course, you know, with him I went. And, uh, um, you know, so, you know, it was something that I always tried to work my way back to. Um, and uh, I finally found a job that, um, although a lot of people think that this was like, you know, that they ask me every day now, what do you really do? <laughs> so uh, I, you know, I, I, I think I've, I've finally found the place that I'm the most comfortable with. Um, but, uh, you know, this is a, a definitely, you know, uh, have been, has been a great honor to be able to, to, to do all of this. And, and um, you know, if uh, anybody out there who, uh, you know, loves their historic site, go volunteer. That's where I started out. So uh, I uh, started out as a volunteer at a historic site, and pretty soon uh, I was working there. So, you know, and even if I get, even if you don't want to work there, they need your help. So <laughs> this is out there true. And, and we're getting, a, that's true. And we're getting a comment, yay, for volunteering. And that, that is the absolute truth. And, um, you know, thank you again. We can't, cannot thank you enough. Thank you for your work. Thank you for being a friend of the ham. And um, if I ever get over to Oklahoma anytime soon, I'm gonna call you up so I can come, so I can come see you. Yeah, so we'll see you. thank you, Mr. Fowler. We truly appreciate right, thank you. Thank you for having me very much. You're welcome. And you're getting a bunch of thank yous in the, in the chats too. So yes. thank you. Um, Man, thank you again, all. I sound like a broken record, but again, thank you, Mr. Fowler for doing this. Thank you to Chef Fowler. Thank you to Arkansas Made. Thank you to Arkansas Grown. Thank you for everybody who was on the panel. Um, even though we're virtual and this is curbside, I feel this and I feel the community and I feel the panelists and I feel the camaraderie with everybody and everybody wanting to learn and doing this. And this is wonderful. So we're going to send out a poll and a survey for everybody to let us know what you think of this. And so please give us your honest feedback on that. And so the next dinner will be focused on apples. It will be October the 21st. Tickets will go on sale September the 20th at one o'clock PM. And anybody who is on this knows that it will sell out. So make sure that you're in front of your computer at one o'clock PM sharp on September 20th to buy tickets if you want to tell people about them make sure you tell them because it will sell out but again i'm jonathan warren i am the historic arkansas museum foundation president i truly thank everybody again for being on this mr fowler thank you chef fowler thank you he can't hear me but thank you for the video 
And again, thank you for all the panelists and everybody being on here. The time is 7.45. Um, this usually goes till eight. We're getting out a little bit early today, but thank you for allowing me to do this. And again, thank you for everybody and the participation and your support of the museum and words cannot express our gratitude enough. And like I said last time, to quote Willy Wonka, who quoted William Shakespeare, parting is such sweet sorrow, but we'll see you next time. Thank y'all and have a good night. Everybody, please stay safe. Thank you.